Welcome to Sabbath School for February 12, 2011. Before we begin, we'd like to ask you to give us a moment of silent prayer. Lord, help us now in this day. Give us your grace. Give us your spirit. Make us blessed. Bless the blessed God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to our study of the Sabbath School lesson for uh, this coming Sabbath, February 12th. We're going to be looking at uh, an impressive dream, the prophetic dream of Nebuchadnezzar. We're here, uh, Brother Idel Suarez and Larry Watts, uh, on the English lesson. Before we go further into the lesson, we'd like to ask you to pray for the work in various places in the world. We have interested souls in many different areas, particularly in Africa now. We have several different countries calling for our attention, as well as other places uh, around the globe. And there are needs also uh, for helping us build new churches because of all the new interests. So if you feel impressed to make a contribution, um, we would, uh, would be much appreciated. And uh, my heart especially goes out to Cameroon, um, and they've been requesting some zinc sheets or tin sheets for their roof of a new chapel there, a place called Boya. All right, uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead with our lesson, and we're going to talk first just briefly about the introduction to our lesson today, which is um, the Sabbath school lesson for last week, God Honors Those Who Honor Him. And this lesson has to do with Daniel's preparation and how those things came about in his life to prepare him to stand before Nebuchadnezzar and what was really in his life that allowed him to do that was first he was very faithful to what he knew. He was diligent in the study of uh, the word and also his studies. He had a heart to stand for God. He realized that he was in a foreign country and yet he accepted that graciously. The spirit of prophecy said he has a different spirit and we can see that in his works and in his words. And Daniel came uh, to a, a life-threatening situation where Ariok knocked on his door and he was told that the wise men were going to be destroyed. And so he gathered his three friends and they prayed earnestly for deliverance. And God gave him deliverance. And the first thing that da Daniel did was to say thank you and praise God for his mercy. And he showed great humility and faith in his... Um, response to what God had done for him. And the lesson brings out that we too, who live in this day and age, especially our young people, are called to have, live lives like, like Daniel did, to let their light shine, even in university or in school, wherever they are. And God may bring or allow certain, you can say, critical things to happen, even light-threatening things to happen. But if we turn to the Lord, as these Jewish captives did, God will give them a victory, and the world will be given a witness of who God really is. And so we can see that in all of this, God was orchestrating um, a revelation of himself for that time. But as we will see as we study the book of Daniel, that wasn't just for then. The book of Daniel was actually a sealed book in the end, and it was meant to be open and understood really by this age, by the, by the end of the world. So the book of Daniel, the study of the book of Daniel, caused a uh, revival uh, in mid-19th century. And the testimonies, especially the book Testimonies of Ministers, tells us that this study of, of Daniel can also bring a revival in our lives, in our day. And of course, the greatest of all our needs is a revival of primitive godliness in our lives. So as we study Daniel and what God was doing, I, we pray that this study will cause us also deep humility, faith, thankfulness, and praise to God for his deliverance in little things and the big things of our lives. So we're going to look now at how God was reaching this great monarch who was uh, given the, actually the rulership of the world at that time. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. It says that there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known. 
what shall be in the latter days. That's kind of the last thought of our last sentence, uh, last lesson. And now we go into the lesson of our day, which is called the prophetic dream. So, Brother Soares, we're going to give you the first question. How do you read and how do you answer this first question? Well, the first question is asking what the king was thinking about when the Lord gave him the dream. And Daniel, when he's there standing before the king, he not only is going to tell him the dream and the interpretation, he's going to start with the point before the king fell asleep. Mm, I like that. You know, he is sitting at his bed and he's there wondering, what's going to happen after I pass away? What will my children do with the inheritance? Will this kingdom that I have worked so hard to establish, that I received from my fathers, what will become of it? That was going through his mind. What should come to pass hereafter? And Daniel starts with that point, with his great concern, with his great worry. And then, as the question brings out, God, through Daniel, reveals what shall come to pass to the king and to his kingdom. And that is the purpose why Daniel received the dream. God answered Daniel's prayer, not only to tell Nebuchadnezzar what his concern was, what he was mm -hmm. worrying about, but also as a revelation to God's people, to the Jewish people that God would bring judgment upon Babylon that had destroyed the Holy Temple and had destroyed Jerusalem. It, too, would pass away. And also, as we will see as we study the book of Daniel, that it is Daniel, through this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, is going to show that eventually Jesus is going to come in his second coming, to establish an everlasting kingdom that shall never be destroyed, that shall never pass away. So in contrast to Nebuchadnezzar, wondering what's going to happen after, the whole book then, especially this dream, is pointing to something that will not pass away. Isn't that interesting to have that contrast between what he was thinking and that only God can read thoughts, and yet God told Daniel what the king was thinking, and God was actually answering his thoughts as he gave him this dream. But he was doing more than that, of course. He was revealing that what God, Daniel said right at the beginning, which we'll see, that he was revealing that there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. He's the one that sets up and brings down kingdoms. And when Jesus started his ministry, we see that Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. It was the kingdom. That was the great concern of the monarchs of yesteryear. It is a great concern of people today, the kingdom. But we should be thinking of that kingdom that cannot pass away. That is the kingdom of God's glory. But we can't enter into that kingdom of glory unless we enter first into the kingdom of grace. We need time before we go to bed every night and to communicate with our God and to tell him that we are sorry for our sins and to plead for his forgiveness, to plead for his guidance, that we may be resurrected or may live to see the day when the kingdom of glory shall be established. Right, and I like this first note too because it talks about that Daniel did not hesitate to make his faith known where he was. And that was the secret, it says, of his power. And so when we see that he was willing to do that even in the midst of captivity, we too need to see that as our place in our time, no matter where we are. We might have different limitations, but these are only God's opportunities. Uh, Brother Watts, I underlined in my note where it says, did that faithful recognition of God detract from Daniel's influence in the king's court? No. And she writes, by no, means. by no means. And it was the secret, as you said, the by no secret. means. Sometimes our young people hesitate, sometimes our member hesitate from bringing forth their faith, their belief that they worship a God of creation because they think that will detract from their influence. Mm -hmm. But the scriptures say that will not detract from our influence. Right, so we have this verse 
Daniel 2, 29, where Daniel makes it clear that he's not uh, there for himself, but he's there to bring glory to God. Now we have the next question. is What did the king see in his very special dream uh, of what made... Um, uh, of what was the image made. So we see that this was a, a composite image, and Daniel starts right out by telling that he saw a great image. Um, its brightness was excellent and uses the word terrible in the King James Version, which means really wonderful or beyond wonderful. The image was a head of gold and a bra uh, arms of silver, the belly of thigh, so brass, and the legs iron part of, part of iron and part of clay. So here in three verses, Daniel is describing, or God is describing to Nebuchadnezzar, yes, we're answering your question, Nebuchadnezzar. Your kingdom is not going to last forever. And of course, that comes into Daniel chapter 3 when he tries to change history. But here we see that the great impressive dream, uh, which he had forgotten but knew that it was um, supernatural, were, uh, was an answer to what he was asking. So the dream and the great image opened before Nebuchadnezzar events reaching to the close of time in three verses. You know, when I, when he, I've often wondered, how was it that Satan could take Jesus on the mountain and show him everything? You know, if God could show the whole history of the world, certainly the uh, opponent could some way, through symbols or whatever, uh, re represent the kingdoms of this earth. Because God had already done it. So he knew how to do that, you might say. So I like how Uriah Smith brings out that God chose those elements in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in order to impress Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was an idolater. Mm -hmm. He worshipped images. He bowed down before them. He had gold images. Herodotus tells us that in Babylon there was this huge image of pure gold that was in the temple. Mm -hmm. And it may have been a type or a copy of the big golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had made. And so when Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, he sees this image that represents God, and he sees all these elements that he worshipped, that he wanted. He wanted gold, he wanted silver, and he knew that iron was powerful and strong, so it really caught his attention. And the other point I want to make out is the way to remember all these minerals is to make an analogy with the Olympics. First place oh. is a gold medal. <laughs> yeah. Second place silver. is a silver medal. Third place is a bronze medal. So the head is of gold, the two arms, which we know are going to be two kingdoms, the Medes mm -hmm. and the Persians, uh, is going to be silver. And the belly and the thighs are going to be bronze the third. And if there was a fourth medal in the Olympics, perhaps it would be iron. Yeah, perhaps it would be. So these were objects of esteem, as Uriah Smith brings out. And gold, I guess, was the, the means of uh, money exchange in Babylon. Later, of course, Medo-Persians did use silver. Yes. And they're the ones who actually uh, set up a money standard. Uh, as we would know it today. They were the ones who invented that system. Um, but here we find that the perfect semblance of Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom was gold. I remember when we were in the Pergamon Museum, we saw the great lion yes. on the walls of the gates of, uh, of Babylon and read the inscription, this is Bab Babylon, which I have made right in the cuneiform letters. Of course, we can't read cuneiform, but that's what it said. And we're reminded of the greatness of Babylon as we saw it there. In, um, in, in East uh, Berlin. You know, it's fascinating that you say that the Medo Persians were the one who started this monetary system. In Spanish, when you say money, there is no word for money. Well, you could say dinero, money, but it, it, there's another synonym that is used, and that is silver. You say silver, plata. Yeah, well, it was during. Plata, silver. It's silver. I was listening, uh, <laughs> studying some history recently, and it was the Medo Persians that actually set up the system that we have, and they use silver as their, as their means of, uh, of exchange. So now we have the second question. We see the dream. We don't have um, to worry about uh, the, what it means so much, because we understand that, and there have been many depictions of this. But let's go on in our lesson. 
without worrying about all this glory and this pomp, which was the center of Babylon. Uh, what does it tell us uh, from Daniel 2, 34 and 35? And the question asked in relation to that is exactly this. Even though the image in the dream was very impressive, what was to happen to it and to the kingdoms which it represented? Well, the stone was cast, not by hand, and this stone is so strong that when it hits the image at its feet, not at its head, but at its feet, it breaks the feet, it breaks the entire image into pieces, and the stone doesn't break. It is so strong, this stone. I can imagine this meteorite that just comes, boom, and hits at the feet. And that has prophetical significance that the coming of Christ will come, will happen. The kingdom of glory will come when the ten kings are reigning or those that are descendants of those ten kings. Yes, brother. You know, I, I can't help but think about the twin towers in this yes. symbolism. You know, the reason is, is because the Twin Towers were a symbol of the, well, they're the trade, World Trade Center. You know, the whole system of money and exchange and business was in the, symbolized by those buildings. So we find then, I just think of how they came down that way. Like It's like the stone hitting the image at his feet. And I just wonder how God looks at that and how close we may be to the end of time. Because there, the world had in its eyes, in its eyesight, something that's played over and over again, you know, we could compare it here to this because all that was centered, the World's Trade Center was kind of a center of the, of the values that this world treasures. That's right. It was a modern Tower of Babel. Modern Twin Tower. Towers, yeah, yes. Right. And it has a reference to Babylon. And the note or the scriptures state that it all became shaft, that entire image, with the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and the clay. When the stone hit it, it all became like shaft. Like it shaft. just blew away. Mm -hmm. The wind carried it away. And to us that study prophecy, we know that wind symbolizes war. Mm -hmm. And this world is the story of war. And the last world war will take place when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory and he will put away all these kingdoms of the world. Yeah. So we see now that God is actually speaking to the world in these events. Um, we're not saying that he's orchestrating them at all. But when men turn away from God, they make themselves vulnerable to the whims of Satan. And... What we see in Israel was that because of their unfaithfulness, God allowed them to go into captivity. But God was not going to allow his name to be defamed. Even in Israel, he had a way of proving himself to be the God of all gods. And that's what actually is happening here in this, um, in this dream. God is showing that all the wise men and all their uh, enchantments and all their blessings and and things were not where the action was. The action was in a humble, quiet spirit of a man named Daniel and his three friends. What one young man could do if God is his stay and his strength. That's right. Now, there's one more detail in this dream, and that is that that stone became a mountain. It became, became a, mountain, a huge filled mountain the whole earth. and filled the whole earth. And we believe that the whole earth needs to be filled with the glory of God. Right. As I was reading the lesson, I was really impressed with reading the description of Babylon, the city itself, how it was, mm -hmm. you know, 60, what it was, miles around. It was perfectly square. And, yes. and that's kind of interesting when you get to the book of Revelation. That's you right. talk about this new Jerusalem, which is going to be the center of this new earth. And there's a river of water, right. a river of life that flows, mm -hmm. and the tree of life, like the hanging gardens. There's all these parallels. You know, it's interesting that it says it's a, uh, what, um, 15 miles on a side. That's and right. And yet, it says in the note that the river was 30 miles inside the city. Did you notice that? No, I didn't notice the that 30 was miles. Very, very interesting. But I did notice the 15 miles on every, every side. Every river that flows goes twice as far as it needs to to go to the sea. 
that's a, re a re recent hydraulic engineering that's uh, right. factor. It's 30 miles of river wall through its center. So it had to go twice as far through the city as it was across, straight across. So maybe it went from corner to corner, whatever, but it was uh, 30 miles of river inside this 15 square mile, uh, 15 on each side. Interesting, because that goes along with geology. But now, what did this whole gold, head of gold represent? So now, let's remember that in Bible prophecy you have something called repeat and enlarge. So we have the basic outline and symbols of the prophecy. Now we're going to have the interpretation of that prophecy. This is a standard procedure in prophecy, and that's why we call Daniel 2 the Bible prophecy primer. Because if we understand how to understand prophecy, we need to begin here in this second chapter of Daniel. And it says that this head of gold was to be was a symbol of Babylon, and to follow that was also the kingdoms of Medo Persia. Although we don't see those names here in Daniel, we see them later in Daniel 8. Um, it says, After thee shall come another kingdom. Uh, and uh, it says, thou art this head of gold. So that's the next. Uh... That's right. Nebuchadnezzar was given the opportunity by God in his providence, by God's sovereign grace, mm -hmm. to be the king of kings. You know, that is a title that God gives to Jesus as he comes in the book of Revelation. Yet here in the book of Daniel, it says, thou, O king, art the king of kings, meaning that he was the emperor over all the kings of on earth at that time and he was to stand in the place of God on earth he needed to honor God in the book child guidance sister white says that parents are in the place mm. of God before yeah. their parents uh, pastors are to represent Jesus are to represent God before the people and rulers are also thou art that head of gold and I can imagine that head that of really gold. Hit him and I can imagine that head that of gold. Really hit gold. him and side to the other, and he's thinking in his mind, why isn't the entire image of gold if I am the gold? Maybe so. Maybe he put those pieces together. <laughs> but I can remember what Daniel says next, and we'll get that, because, of course, in, lesson, uh, in question six, I believe, uh, question seven, uh, or are we going to get that far? No, yes, I don't think question five, I yep. think it says. Uh, but Daniel says, after thee. Now, who would come before the king of kings and say, after mm -hmm. thee? That's the next one. Yeah. So. Now, it would not be all of gold. His kingdom would not last forever. There would be a point where Babylon would cease to be, a city that was impregnable. And that's what question five, if you'll allow me to read it. It says, when did this mighty empire begin? Who built it up to its height of power? And this kingdom began with one of the first Babylonian kings, or the first Babylonian king. The, king. First. the yeah. first, and that was Nimrod. 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 He no, was did, the first. I did a study of the first word in the Bible is Bereshit. The second place that that word is used is here, here in this verse. So two is kind of a number of separation. And the second time, the beginning, it says here, it was the beginning of his kingdom. Yes. That's, that's very the word. interesting. But ish, that's right. Yeah, it's the second time the word Bereshit is used. So in the, the Genesis. Bible. This is the, the Genesis. The Genesis of the opponent of God. Yes. Nimrod. First God and then second Nimrod. Mm -hmm. And Nimrod, according to Jewish oral tradition, and Josephus speaks about this in his mm -hmm. book on the antiquity of the Jews, that Nimrod was responsible for building the Tower of Babel. So we believe that Babylon was built upon the ruins of the Tower of Babel that was started by Nimrod. And mm -hmm. it was in Nimrod's day that the languages started on Earth, right. the diverse languages. God confused and brought confusion. Right, so we see there's a connection here. And it's interesting that uh, Abraham was called out of Babylon. And that's the message we have today, too, you know, connecting the... The whole message is together. We have the literal and we have the spiritual applications here in the foundations, you might say, the genesis of the, the three angels' message here in uh, this story of, of Daniel. Now, the qu question is, who built it up to its height of power? It was 
Nebuchadnezzar, but really we need to start with Nebuchadnezzar's dad. And I brought with me, Brother Watts, one of the best encyclopedias I have found in the English language mm. for the Bible, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. And I've looked under the title Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar is really Nebuchadnezzar II, mm -hmm. according to historians. And his father was Nabopolazar. And Nabopolazar was the one responsible for overthrowing Nineveh. Yeah, that's right. It was. He's the one that brought it about. Nineveh finally fell before Uman Mandahords and was razed to the ground. And it was Nabopolazar who made an alliance with Uman Manda. And together they brought Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, down to the ground. And Nabopolazar made an arrangement by having his son Nebuchadnezzar marry the daughter of a king of that region. So we see that now when Nabopolassar dies, his son Nebuchadnezzar, that was very well educated, he was a great general, he was mm -hmm. a great architect and a visionary, was the one who really remodeled and continued on the fame from his father, much like Alexander continued on the fame and the foundation that his father had established. Yeah, we read on in history too that uh, I believe Alexander the Great I kind of finished off Nebuchadnezzar and made that stone uh, a rock where the fishermen would cast their, you know, dry their nets. So Neb uh, uh, the city of Nineveh uh, was a, it's an interesting history uh, behind it in, uh, in world history, and I didn't realize uh, until you mentioned it, you know, that it was first that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the one who brought it down. Now we're talking about the uh, historical aspects here, and we read about the great empire, the great city of Babylon, how it, how it was magnificently uh, built, and uh, how it was. We already mentioned some of that. Uh, we can read the note uh, as we go through the lesson. We've studied that, how it had a moat around it, and how well it was protected, and how secure the people felt, and yet we see that security was a false security because God had his own way in it. So Babylon's glory declined, and it came a time for it to fall. What expressions did the prophet Isaiah employ to describe Babylon's glory? We find in Isaiah there that in Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty, excellency of the Chaldeans. So we find that this glory was going to fade away. It wasn't going to last forever. So, and that it was, again, I think God allowed all these things because upon whom the ends of the world uh, have come, these things were all written for our learning because we need not fear what's happening on the earth of the things that are going on because God has his hand in, in it. And so we see that the, the whole earth was prostrate at the feet of Babylon, uh, a queen of peerless grandeur, it says, drawing from the pen of inspiration itself this glowing title the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellent. That's what Isaiah uh, called it, what we just read. So such was Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And I would really think that um, it's, a, it's really a challenge, a wonderful thing, that God was working with the heart of Nebuchadnezzar in all of this, and he was calling him to repentance and to, the, to his kingdom through all of this. And it seems to me that... Uh, we should think about what we're doing in this day, in this day and age, when we have an opportunity to deal with and to interchange or interact with the leaders of this world. We should keep in mind what I believe we're seeing in this lesson. We should reach out to them and appeal to them as Daniel did. And how he talked to Nebuchadnezzar was a wonderful thing, he, appealing to his heart. To, and that's where he began. He, what were you thinking about? What was in your heart? And so he began there to call Nebuchadnezzar to God. And of course, it was a long process. We see that Nebuchadnezzar in the following chapters, how he lifted up his heart because of pride. Um, and he himself fell, which was kind of a symbol of what was going to happen to, Neb uh, to Babylon itself. So we find that um, talks about them 
uh, there in the city of Babylon, what would you think about if you left your glorious land and you're sitting there in Babylon, you're basically slaves, and that's what we read in Psalm 137. Oh. By the rivers of Babylon, Babylon, there we sat down, yea, wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the trees, the willows there, and uh, they were carried away. But at that same time, God was seeking to reach not only Nebuchadnezzar, but the whole world through that situation. So sometimes we feel like we're in captivity, but we need to remember this story, what they did in their darkest hour, hanging their harps, you know, that's a symbol of joy, that's a symbol of heaven. But they hung their harps there and cried and wept. But Daniel was called to witness for God even in that dark hour. This Babylon was one remarkable city. And we must highlight that during the 1800s, there were many professors of religion who stood up in Germany and said that this was all false, that there never had been a city of Babylon. There never was a King Nebuchadnezzar. And that was the root of higher criticism. And they criticized the Bible. Ironically, it was the Germans who discovered mm -hmm. right. Babylon in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And they, you and I, Brother Watts, saw the Ishtar Gate, which is in Berlin today, mm -hmm. as part of the Pergamon Museum. And it is a remarkable sight how they have re united those stones stone for stone stone for stone when they took it apart in babylon they numbered everyone they made very good notes very good plans and they brought it to berlin they weren't able to set it up because of world war one but after world war one they were able to put it up and it's there for tourists to see for bible students to look at and see this physical evidence showing that there was a city of babylon there was a king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was so proud he had his name stamped on the bricks. Mm -hmm. He did not want his name to be forgiven, forgotten. And as we think of this city, how they had this tunnel built under the river. To yes. me, that's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, not just that it was a square, but that it had a tunnel going right under the river. And I tell you, we need a tunnel too. We need a tunnel to communicate between us and God. We're, and that tunnel, I believe, is, is prayer. When we can be united with God, we can get under and away from all the detractions here on earth to communicate with our Heavenly Father and look upon that excellency above. Not at Paris, not at New York, with its tall towers, mm. no, but upon that city whose builder and, and architect is God. Yeah, well, we're talking about the history of Babylon now and its fall. Of course, if you read Revelation 17 and 18, we have the symbolic uh, references to this. Ba uh, Revelation has seen more texts from the Old Testament than any other, and this illusion uh, that we find in Jeremiah and here the statements of future history, which are, we find here in Daniel and which are corroborated now by historical facts, which you were just mentioning. We find uh, that what... With what words did he outline the future of this glorious city and how long did Babylonian empire last? Isaiah says that it would be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, that it would never be inhabited again. Yeah, that's again. the most important thing. It would never be inhabited. Yeah, Alexander the Great paid for thousands of his soldiers and men to clean up the area of the city of Babylon. He wanted to make that his new capital, but he died. Saddam Hussein started a rebuilding project, and he was hanged. Mm. That city will not and cannot be re rebuilt. Josh McDowell, in his book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, brings out this text from Isaiah, and he says that that is prophecy that has been fulfilled. There are only wild animals yeah. there. Yeah. There, it, the Bible says not even the Arab would pitch his tent. Mm -hmm. That is so significant. It would lie desolate. Now, for someone to say that at the height of the glory of Babylon is unbelievable. Un un unbelievable. Unthinkable. Yeah. Only through the revelation of God. 
So we find as we go down through history, and we, we're going to study also about uh, the fall of Babylon and uh, Daniel chapter 6, but here it's referred to when the Persians came, um, the first, this great, grand, glorious empire. So, you know, the, bio, the world says the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So they were uh, very, very prosperous, but they soon came to a quick end. And of course, we know that um, righteousness is exalt a nation, and sin is a shame to any people. So we have a need of considering that there is cause and effect here all the way along. So he speaks of the of the doom of Bab Babylon the Great, and it comes to the end that uh, what it's really pointing to, he doesn't leave out the, the key point, and that is that the saints will come and, and inherit the land. So there's a full circle here. He doesn't fail to go to the end. He says they shall uh, do many things, but he, his point is that God is going to um, re have, have his people take uh, the, the kingdom in the end. So he speaks of the mortality of man. He speaks of the, um, the, the glories of, of this earth are, are what we would call fading things. They are not enduring. And if you look at the, the chapter as a whole, you're going to see that there are basically five elements in the chapter, and that is Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, uh, Rome. Then we, then we see the feet of iron and clay. And then we jump to the stone, which is cut out without hands. But in between the feet and iron and clay and the stone, we see something emphasized in the book of Daniel in chapter 7 and later, and that is the judgment. The judgment of God takes place. And as we look at the book of Daniel, it's very important to note that Babylon was symbolized by gold. Nebuchadnezzar was there. And he um, was the one who was symbolizing the kingdoms of this world and where the kingdoms of this world do not want to come into accountability before God. And that's what I see missing in chapter 2, intentionally missing, because the judgment isn't emphasized. It's only the executive judgment, not the investigative judgment as mentioned. So that's the lesson all the way along. While man does not want to recognize it, it's still going to come. So that's our message today. We, have, we live in the time of the investigative judgment. We live in the time of the real judgment. Yes, and I think it's relevant for us to emphasize that Isaiah compared Babylon to Sodom and Gomorrah. When countries or when governments reach the point of being like Sodom and Gomorrah, they are destroyed. History repeats itself. And we mm -hmm. see that Jesus said that his coming would be as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we look at the nations in the West, how they have become like Sodom today. Yes. That it becomes part of the news clips on the internet, on the TV, in the newspaper, emphasizing the immorality. We are reaching that point of equaling Sodom and its immorality. And when we do, then the same fate that came upon Babylon literally will come upon those kingdoms that cease to acknowledge God as the sovereign God and his uh, law as supreme. Well, we go back to Israel again. They had forgotten God. God brought judgment. And then when uh, Babylon uh, starts to glorify itself and Belteshazzar's that symbolic you know, revelry, God writes his finger on the wall. You're found wanting. So let's remember these lessons because they are for us who live on the end of the world. Let's give glory to God, do so humbly, and take his word as it stands. Even though men may criticize it and put their minds above the word, the word is the authority. And Jesus Christ is the living word. He is our authority. And he is the one we trust in. Daniel did, and I'm, and I'm really interested to find out that day when I can talk to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how was it in the fire with the Lord? <laughs> we, some of us may be going through the fire today, but the Lord says he's going to be there with us. Amen. And it'll be nice to hear the words of even kingly men like Nebuchadnezzar. I see four men in the fire and one's like the Son of God. So may the Lord help us. If you're going through your troubles and trials today, you feel like you're in the fire, believe it or not, Jesus is there with you. And we pray that those who are on the outside 
and who's looking in and can maybe have a glimpse of the troubles or difficulties you may be having in your life, they can say, wow, God must be with him because he's taking it so well. May the Lord help us to climb that mountain and stand with Jesus Christ. This is my prayer. Amen. Amen. So we wish you a blessed Sabbath day, and may God give you a special spirit as you study this man, Daniel, who had a, a special spirit, and, and his lessons that he wishes to teach us uh, from his book, which God has provided for us who live in these days. God bless you, and may the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The communion of God and his love in your hearts is our prayer. Amen. Well, thank you for being with me here.